Okay, I think we'll uh, go ahead and get started. Uh, thanks everybody for joining us uh, for the meeting today. Uh, we have uh, on the screen, I believe we have, let me see if I got everybody, Bob Schrager, Jeff, Don, John O'Brien, Mike Good, Melissa Spears, uh, Dr. Murphy, Charles King, and somebody, Lewis, it looks like you're on. I want to let you know that we are recording this. So I did talk to Ella, and she's going to post it on the YouTube channel so you can watch and listen to it in its entirety. Um, if you don't want to, like, take time away from being at the beach where you are currently and listen to this, uh, listen to this meeting, just to let you know if you wanted to drop off. Uh, thanks, everybody, for joining us for today's meeting. We have a guest speaker today, and we're going to go ahead and let her uh, go ahead and, and tell us a little bit about what's going on. We have uh, Mary Zinnick. Uh, who is uh, going to be our guest speaker today. Mary, the floor is yours. We are the Government Affairs Committee. You know that. You've been here. Uh, <laughs> so you're pretty familiar with what we're doing. We'll need to speak up a little bit so that they can hear you um, as well. And it's going to pick you up from these microphones. Oh, okay. So that's why we kind of have to speak a little bit loud. Okay. Excellent. Well, thank you for having me here. Yeah, on the way out here, I was thinking it was about eight years ago, I think that I said when we parents and members, of the Governmental Affairs Committee and then was very honored to serve as the POA, uh, as an elected member of the POA Board of Directors. You uh, can't hear Mary. You need to speak up. You gotta really okay. loud. <laughs> okay. Is that better? A little better. Okay. Okay. I will try to not move my head around so much too. I'm rounding the table and that not doesn't work real good, I guess. Um so uh, it's always a pleasure to drive back into Hot Springs Village. Um, it's such a beautiful location out here. It's just a ah when you hit the village gate. So um, I now uh, and still work for Visit Hot Springs. Um, I am the Cultural Affairs Manager, which means I have the honor of working with our sister city program still, as I did when I served on the board um, in Hot Springs. And Hot Springs Village, a lot of villagers kind of claim it as well. Um, <coughs> the city of Hot Springs, we have a sister city in northern Japan, and I think some of the principles of sister city can certainly apply to us here a little bit closer to home, um, of finding common ground with people that uh, maybe think differently than we do, um, are from a different area, have some different beliefs, so I think those uh, principles we can certainly apply to living with our neighbors here a little bit closer to home. Um, I also work with the arts community. Um, Hot Springs has a thriving arts com community and has for decades. Uh, many people travel here or have moved here specifically for our arts community. Um, so part of my job is to promote Hot Springs as an arts destination for our tourists to come here, um, to draw attention to the different arts events that we have going on in the Hot Springs area. And that's great for tourists, but even better for those of us who live here, whether in Hot Springs or here in Hot Springs Village. Um, we have many different cultural activities that uh, can serve the members of our Hot Springs community and any event that's an arts event that you go to in Hot Springs, there's almost always Hot Springs Village residents there as well, active on the many boards and organizations that produce those arts events. Um, and you know that that is a part of our economy, our creative economy of this area. You know, of course, we have tourism, we have wonderful medical facilities here in Hot Springs, um, and a part of that tourism and the economy overall is our creative economy. So that's culinary arts, design, of course, the galleries and the studios that open up as well. And um, I think, I remember from my time living in Hot Springs Village, when people come to visit Hot Springs Village, of course, they're wowed by the golf courses and the lakes and all of the trails and many outdoor activities. But a big draw for Hot Springs Village and the quality of life of people in Hot Springs Village is that, it, is that it's located to a, a tourist destination. So they're able to enjoy Oak Lawn and able to enjoy the arts festivals and different events that go on there. So I certainly think as far as how that serves Hot Springs Village and the connection between Hot Springs and Hot Springs Village, um, 
you know, that's that's certainly a, a large component of the connection between the two. Um, things like Gallery Walk, which tonight is Gallery Walk, and um, I can't talk, David had asked me to cover how, you know, the cultural connection between Hot Springs and Hot Springs Village and how we can increase that, the quality of life and different elements like that. Um, we can't talk about that without talking about COVID as well and how COVID has impacted um, the quality of life and the economy for um, the greater Hot Springs area. Um, tourism obviously was impacted in a major way by uh, COVID. Um, it was the first to be impacted really with your restaurants and your um, hotels being shuttered completely or reduced capacity or restricted um, services. So uh, Hot Springs has been dealt a crippling blow over the past few months with COVID. Um, and so have our arts events and our cultural offerings in the area. Um, coming into Labor Day weekend, normally people would be coming from all over the place to enjoy the Blues Festival and Jazz Society events on uh, Labor Day weekend. It's not happening this year. So those cultural organizations, now is the time they need the support of those who are involved locally and the support of people at Hot Springs and Hot Springs Village because they were not able to produce those events in a safe manner that draw people together. Um, gallery walk, you know, those that we've become very uh, accustomed to being online and ordering everything online, you know, because of the COVID restrictions. So we have the artists and the galleries that are still paying rents. Some of them were able to um, garner uh, financial assistance through some of the programs as a result of COVID. But now is the time those small businesses downtown and the artists need the support of the local people here. This is part of our quality of life in Hot Springs and in Hot Springs Village. And so now is the time reaching out, shopping in those small businesses downtown um, or and here in the village as well. Um, and the galleries and gallery walk and things like that. That's now is the time that that's very, very important. Um, we do have two uh, cultural events coming up. We have uh, Arts in the Park, which is normally held in the springtime. It was postponed this year to fall. Um, thinking, you know, everybody thought we'd be past all this by fall and that we could go on as planned with our outdoor arts festival and everything just as we had planned in April. Um, well, that's not happening. Um, so we will be doing a much very, uh, or a much different version, but still celebrating, advocating, and promoting the arts and culture of this area. And like some organizations, we've even been able to expand the reach of that through virtual programming. Um, so, for example, studio tours. Many Hot Springs Village residents, people come from, came from all over to tour studios all around Garland County. Well, this year, we're, there will be some studios opening up, opening their doors for studio tours during Arts in the Park. But um, we are doing 20 studio tours virtually, which I think can serve as a way to promote our area long after studio tours are up, over, long after this arts festival is over. Hot Springs, Hot Springs Village, we can promote our arts community and the cultural offerings of this area by sharing those connections to our local artists so that um, it just kind of keeps us in the forefront of that conversation. Um, also, Documentary Film Festival is coming up. Uh, that's something that's a tremendous support from Hot Springs Village each year. Um, documentary film, um, I thought uh, it's always been a good fit for me uh, education, with the education level here in Hot Springs Village and coming from larger towns. Um, there's more, a lot of diverse offerings for the documentary. So this year it's going to be all virtual, which means you can purchase a ticket and you don't have to be at the Arlington at six o'clock on Thursday. You could watch it at 10 o'clock on Tuesday or Saturday afternoon. Um, so you can, you have a little bit uh, larger expansion of, of the time when you can see those. And some drive-in movie offerings too, which um, that's always a lot of fun. So, um, and I'm working with a new, 
public art, a mural, and a um, large bronze sculpture by Long Washu that will um, highlight the first visitors to our area, the Native Americans who came here long before any of us um, saw the beauty of this valley of the Hot Springs area. Um, and now to kind of turn a little bit more to, I work for Visit Hot Springs. And so I can't be here in front of all of you without sharing the impact that COVID has had on our tourism industry. Our, rest, our restaurants only at 66%. Many of the hotels were closed or had very diminished capacity for several months. And the Hot Springs um, Convention Center that's usually bursting with activity all spring, all summer, all winter long, we've had about 110 events canceled. From walking through the halls in the convention center, I can tell you there are some days where we have three events going on. And we had just a handful of events for the entire month of September. I think there were three small events. So um, while some businesses and some industries have been able to receive uh, the assistance and support to help them through this time, Hot Springs, or Visit Hot Springs has not. The Convention Center has not. Um, through another round of layoffs this week, the Convention Center has laid off 40, permanently laid off 45% of our staff. Um, very few events going through the rest of the year. So um, if they're, we're working right now to um, uh, hopefully receive some assistance in some way, um, as I mentioned before, tourism was the first impacted and will be the last to recover. So we need, we need the help of all of the voices here in Hot Springs Village, the people in this room, the people on Zoom, to reach out and ask our elected officials to support the tourism industry. Um, because especially in this area, Hot Springs and Hot Springs Village, we rely on tourism. I mean, how many events here in Hot Springs Village have been canceled or postponed, golf tournaments? And those are people that would normally be coming here to visit and hopefully fall in love with the place and come back and and purchase property and be our future residents of this area. So we just ask to, you know, as far as governmental affairs go, to please help us uh, reach out and support that. Um, leisure travel has been strong. Um, if you drive through downtown Hot Springs any weekend this uh, summer, especially going into Labor Day weekend, leisure travel is not what it's been in the past. But, you know, if you can't fly somewhere or you don't want to go to Florida and join all the other folks on the beach, People come to Hot Springs. We found that out in 2008 when the economy goes down, doesn't affect Hot Springs quite so much. People will hop in the car and come enjoy downtown Hot Springs as leisure travel. But we do not have those conferences and conventions that are filling up the hotels and the restaurants that we normally have. And so that has dealt a pretty significant blow to us. Um, but, you know, there, there's hope we'll get through this. I mean, we, we always have tourism will recover, but any assistance that, that we could receive would certainly be appreciated um, from, from the uh, governmental assistance support. Um, as far as the future, uh, we, we, as you drive into downtown, well, before we get there, on November 3rd, there's an election coming up. And there's a, the sales tax, the continuation of the sales tax to fund highways. That's very, very important. And with all of the talk about COVID, that conversation has kind of maybe not been on the forefront of attention. So we certainly, to make that connection between Hot Springs Village and Hot Springs as easy as possible, we need to continue that uh, highway funding. So we just encourage everyone to be supportive of that. I've got my Hotspur Village Chamber Board hat on for that one. So please, yeah, please get out and vote for that one. Um, we have, as you go into downtown Hot Springs, the Majestic property there on your right hand side where we lost the Majestic Hotel. And um, that is, as you probably all followed along with reading on, in the paper and so forth, um, it's in the progress to the next stage where um, the leaders at uh, 
City of Hot Springs are discussing the development requirements of the property and what exactly will be on that property um, of the people who submitted plans. So they progress on to that. And then, um, so we have the majestic sites and then the majestic field. And kind of looking forward on that, of getting us through this, those majestic fields, the five baseball fields that will have the turf. Will, like, do any of you have grandchildren that play travel sports? Have you been to see their games? It's crazy. It is crazy. People come from all over. My daughter played basketball, and we would go rolling into town. We'd eat at restaurants. Part of the time, you stay in hotels. And, you know, it's, it's a serious thing. You're there for several days. And so, with having those turf uh, baseball fields, in hot springs that will certainly bring a significant number of baseball tournaments to hot springs and softball tournaments. So all those players and their families. Um, the upside for those who live that live here is that it provides a place for our children to play sports too. And these will be the finest fields in this region, with them being turf, which means you know those are spring sports, and it only takes a thunderstorm to wipe out a baseball tournament. So that will allow the turnaround to be you know, quick. And so that, um, they'll do the groundbreaking as soon as it stops raining for an air. So when everybody gets to see, well, they've already done the groundbreaking, the, the official groundbreaking, but they're going to actually go start building it now, the serious groundbreaking. So um, I talked a little bit. I can certainly answer some questions. Or I wasn't quite sure how much time to take up as a guest, so I, I know y'all have other business to attend to as well. Where, where are the fields? The field um, on Belding. Uh, do you know where the baby, the boys club was? Yes. Okay, right there. And there's significant history in that area. There was um, some disgruntled major league baseball teams from sharing the same field over on Whittington. And so some of them decided, okay, we're not, we're going to leave those fields and we'll build our own fields. And so they named them the Majestic Fields because when the players were in town for spring training, um, they always stayed the Majestic Hotel. And so they named their fields the Majestic Fields. So that's kind of some hot spring baseball history. So that's what the, the fields will be called now. So that's the origin. If, if you build it, they will come. <laughs> yes, absolutely. And there's a tremendous amount of research went into this too. I mean, <coughs> as far as the the uh, level of the fields in the surrounding area, the need for this, and it's just a nice a nice balance to get uh, family travel to offering. Yeah, one thing. Yes, sir. I, I agree with you that you know the village needs to promote hot springs. At the same time, when we have activities, we need hot springs to support promote the village because we're having we're suffering and going through the same things hot springs is and it should be a way where we can work together and actually promote each other's events um that's but with arts in the park coming up um we always try to with promotion of those activities promote anything that's going on in hot springs village you know, that's the 10 day festival of arts. So, any arts activities that go on, we put those hot spring village activities and promote it in general with that. Um, so, absolutely, I agree. That's something that the people who come to Hot Springs Village, odds are pretty good they're going to venture outside the gates and come on down into Hot Springs while they're here. And so, we certainly should be partnering on, on that. Mary, I think one of the other things that we need to remember as well is not only kind of the, you know, the restaurants, you know, which are near and near our heart, my heart, the yeah, hotels, you know, and things like that, but performers. Yeah. Um, you know, we, my, my place here, we do live music on Fridays and Saturdays, and I can't tell you how many performers have come and how many keep calling because they have not performed anywhere in months. Um, in fact, one of the lead performers that we've had here at like the chamber, as the headline act of the chamber, I was downtown, Ken Goodman, he's singing on the street downtown, right? So we need to remember that. And when we go somewhere and we see live music or live performance, please, you know, take care of those people because they are not, 
They do not have any work at all. And they were not eligible for any of these programs from the government or unemployment or any of those things. So it's been a huge challenge for the performers, both the musical performers, arts performers, everything. Yes, I mean, when, when I said we had to reconfigure arts in the park, what we canceled was the outdoor arts festival, which is where you have two days of a stage where you have poets and musicians performing all day long for two days. Well, you can't gather people together like that, but exactly, you know, tip the, tip the performers, absolutely, because, you know, restaurants, it's a, it's a service to have those people. So are there some things that maybe potentially that Hot Springs Village, the POA, uh, could do to work better with what's going on with the visitor center or you know any of these other events? Are there suggestions you would have for us on how we can potentially work better? You know, to more better coordinate, like Sam was saying, how we kind of coordinate together better, right, on doing things. Absolutely. Um, and I mean, not, not to venture too far into the village, you know. Uh, arrangements that, I mean, Leslie and Allie had a great relationship with and was very, very well respected in Hot Springs. And so having that, uh, having the new manager be a visible face in Hot Springs um, with Chamber, Metro Partnership, and having villagers involved in those uh, organizations is certainly a way to do that. Um, and even, um, you know, I mentioned uh, Hot Springs, the, the participation in arts events and an organization, organizations in Hot Springs, serving on boards and bringing that wealth of knowledge and support that Hot Springs Village has to, you know, we have a tremendous number of uh, organizations here in Hot Springs Village, but taking that out into Hot Springs is certainly a way to have some continuity between our two, our two communities. So. But yeah, that, um, that's something we can definitely work on. That's great. Any other questions for Mary? Any questions from the Zoom crowd? <laughs> Y'all still awake? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Come on, I see some other faces up there. Jim's gone, Bob Shoemaker, Melissa, throw me a softball. <laughs> All right. When, so, uh, when, when Bob and I don't have any questions, you know you've done a good job, Mary. Uh, <laughs> that's even better than a drop box. <laughs> All right. Well, I'd like to thank you, Mary. Thanks so much for coming out and visiting with us. It's awesome to learn what's going on you know, in Hot Springs. Certainly, uh, we're open to you know, any suggestions you have, things we might be able to do to help, you know, interface that we can try to help interface with the board of directors to see what they can what we might be able to do to help, you know, promote things or events or whatever. And we certainly are, like you said, are all struggling through the COVID, you know, situation. Certainly the, the, the village is part of that problem and uh, you know, it's, it's experiencing that problem as well. So, all right, so. Well, thank you very much. Thank you for having me. Like I said, it's always a pleasure to be back here and see familiar faces and uh, take a trip through the beautiful village. So <laughs> Maybe you. next time we'll figure out how to get you a better car. So. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, yeah, they let me in. They let me in. Here, I'm going to leave that for you. Okay, great. Yeah, thank you. Appreciate that. Actually, we got two of them, too. I think we got two of them. Oh, you got Actually, three. I'll put all three of them. Okay. That's okay. Don't hang in the middle. Okay. Well, thank you. Sure, appreciate it. We're working together. There you go. Exactly. Thank you. Y'all have a great day. Have a good Labor Day weekend. Oh, come on. Great presentation by Mary. I think uh, it's really good for us to understand kind of some of the things that are going on, especially the tourist side of the business down, you know, in Hot Springs. It is, you know, affecting everyone. So uh, the more we can kind of work together, uh, I think the better we will all be. Uh, so before we start the meeting, I wanted to just uh, take one moment to pause uh, and remember I said of our committee member, David Winlow, uh, who passed away a little over a month ago. A uh, very valued member, you know, of our committee, uh, you know, was very helpful in lots of different ways. I think he served, I don't know how long he served on the committee, Jim. Bob, how long was David on the committee? A long time, right? right yes, he'd been on the committee a long time, but uh, uh, his value, too, to just to the village in terms of his long tenure, uh, 
was it 30 years that he worked for the POA, uh, and uh, we were just blessed here in Hot Springs Village to have the presence of David Whitwell and what he meant. Yeah, I absolutely agree. So just wanted to take just one moment to express the committee's gratitude, uh, you know, to David and, you know, remembering him, you know, for all that he's done for us. So uh, just wanted to point that out, it's a, you know, very, uh, very sorry that, you know, he kind of passed away a little bit suddenly. It seems like only, you know, a few weeks ago, our last meeting, you know, I mean, it doesn't seem that long ago that we saw him. And, uh, you know, it's just a, uh, just a reminder that, you know, these things can happen and let's live every day to the fullest that we can and be thankful and helpful as much as possible to, to all of our neighbors and, and everyone here. So, uh, on a kind of happier note, we've got new members uh, that are joining us. Uh, today is the first meeting for our new member, Sam Sacco, who is uh, sitting over there. You can see him on the wave, Sam, so they can see you on the screen. <laughs> Sam joins us as a committee member. Sam, you want to just give just like one minute, a little bit bio, just for everyone, so that all you know, know kind of a little bit of your history? Yeah, yeah. Retired 2016, the general manager of an ethanol plant. I was planning on moving here then, and I got talked into running for city commissioner. Was appointed, got elected. Then I served uh, as mayor. And then I got pushed in by the Republican Party to run for uh, state representative. And I guess a six term incumbent. And it came close to being there. I, I felt good about that because you know, we were new and she always lived there all the time. <laughs> but then we finally moved here in um, May. So we just moved here. And I guess serving for the public, I kind of got addicted to it. So I saw the opening here, and I applied, and I met with the name Bob, and, and here I am. All right. Welcome, Sam. Thank you. Thank you so much for joining us. We have two uh, additional, we have one additional new member, uh, Charles King, the new general manager of the Hot Springs Village uh, Property Owners Association. He was on the Zoom there with Ella and hey, Charles. Say hi. Can we see you? There he is. Did you want to say anything? Just a couple of comments. I mean, you don't have a report here in a couple of minutes, but you know, yeah, you don't really have yeah, I don't really have a report for you today, but um, just really thrilled to be here. I'm excited to uh, get to know each and every one of the, the, the entities and agencies and schools and you know everything around uh, and working together to try to you know not only make this community better but uh, everything around it. So uh, excited to be here. A lot of work to be done. And uh, like I said, look forward to uh, helping in any way I can to bring this whole thing together and work with each and every one of you guys. All right. Thank you, Charles. I'd like a bad penny. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Pam Avalon, who is now our representative from the Hot Springs Village Board of Directors, is back. <laughs> she still has our old name card. <laughs> <laughs> So welcome back, Pam. Thanks so much for, for joining us again. Uh, so we'll just go ahead and move on with uh, the rest of the meeting. So did everyone receive the meeting minutes? Do I have any uh, comments or suggestions, changes required to the last meeting uh, from the July 10th minutes? And if not, I will accept the motion to accept those minutes. Of, of the way we're organized and uh, 
there's a lot of good things to come, but I'll, uh, I'll, I'll have more of a, maybe some more juice for you next time. Okay, great. Uh, Pam, as our representative from the board of directors, we'll, we'll let you uh, tell us a little bit what's happening uh, at the board level. I'll keep it short. Yes. <laughs> so um, just briefly, the board has been uh, busy figuring out the best way to work with the new general manager and provide support for him. Um, we have been looking at, as he is looking at some ways to make the village better, stronger, more up to date and uh, more to come. So we're, we're kind of like Charles is, we're working on a, a lot of things and you'll hear more later. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Great. Thank you. Yes. Our speaker's not working. Our speaker's, the speaker is not working. Please check your connection. Can you guys hear us? We can hear you all right, Greg, but we, oh, we, we have you. a hard time hearing some of the others. Yeah, there's some weird message that just popped up on the screen that says our speaker's not working, but I uh, was just making sure that everybody needs to speak up because, as I said, it's these microphones and the ceiling are the ones that are actually uh, are picking up the audio for the computer. Uh, next up, uh, just a little bit on broadband and PIPA, I guess I comment on broadband as well. Uh, you know, there has been a lot of kind of activity at the state level on broadband. Um, I did receive some correspondence from uh, Representative Richard McGrew actually a couple of days ago as well um, around this where the state has opened up the broadband grant process to, according to the memo, says all companies. Not sure what that means, but I think that that was opened up specifically to allow First Electric as he commented about that as well in his note in the conversation that I had with him, uh, to be able to apply for grants uh, for broadband service. Uh, I talked to Keith earlier, and we think that still is limited to people that want to be ISPs, which of course is you know uh, its own uh, issue um, in order to do that. But the state is issuing grants. The state has issued uh, a big grant to purchase wireless hotspots for students. I saw in the paper today. I think Little Rock is buying like 5,000 hotspots and hanging them out to any student that wants one. Um, you know, it works great in urban areas like Little Rock and places that have really good cell coverage. It's still a challenge here. Um, as many of us know, we use cell phones here in the village. Um, it's a challenge. So there is activity at the state level uh, on the broadband grant program. They are issuing some grants and have issued some grants. Um, I think there are many, many more. Uh, that are in the pipeline. I believe that based on the, the way the CARES Act is written, they have to basically grant them all by the end of December. So they're on a pretty short fuse uh, to get those done. Um, so next, I'll let Keith talk a little bit. He's been involved with some of the things going on with broadband grants in Saline County. So I'll just go ahead and turn over and let Keith talk okay. a little bit about that. Okay, let me just read you uh, what you will see coming out as a press release. You're getting kind of a, a prelim uh, out there. Saline County, in conjunction with Aristotle Communications, was awarded an Arkansas Rural Connect grant for $2.9 million. This grant was awarded to provide a minimum of 25 degree broadband coverage to the unserved and underserved portions of western and southern Saline County. The areas covered by this ARC grant for broadband installation include Heron Crows, Owensville, Lonsdale, and Traswood. Saline County Je uh, Judge Jeff uh, Airy looks forward to bringing these rural sections of the county into the modern broadband world. The ARC grant application submitted by Saline County Judge Airy did originally include Hot Springs Village. Unfortunately, the state of Arkansas broadband offices database information precluded any grant funding for within Hot Springs Village. Based on coverage input provided by major broadband providers, Hot Springs Village is depicted as having sufficient 25 free broadband coverage in the state database. Saline County officials have requested a graphical depiction of HSB broadband coverage via the Government Affairs Committee last spring. Um, needless to say, we had never, Saline County had never received that, so we were unable to defend or challenge the state's uh, records. 
So um, we know we have spots here in the village that are not 25 degree capable, but we didn't have the ability to take something forward from the county and from Aristotle to move forward to get more, get more grant money for the village. Um, Saline County and Aristotle Communications will continue to review potential avenues of funding for additional broadband service within Hot Springs Village with the hopes that the HSV POA broadband coverage graphical depiction will be available so we can go back to the state. Uh, I hate to say that because we fought hard to get Hot Springs Village included uh, into participating in this grant, but we basically came down to the point where the state and what AT&T and what Suddenlink has put in the state database trumps what we are able to prove. So if there's anything we can prove in the future, uh, Judge Airy and Aristotle, as well as other providers can be willing to, to go to bat. But again, it's gonna be a quick type of stuff here. But the, the, the good thing about this is it will provide broadband coverage right to outside our East Gate. When you start talking Owensville, Perrin, and that area all the way down to Lonsdale, it's gonna swoop all the way down Western and over into Southern Saline County. Um, so, that capability will be put in the state funding. So any questions on this, Pam? So, so to help me understand, um, are you saying that the information that we gathered several months ago and the survey that we put out was basically uh, ignored um, in favor of the AT&T and Sunlink information? I think the, the challenge of what we had been and the, and the POA had committed to us to map the responses we had into their graphical information database because we got responses, but we don't know, there's no way to create a map. Um, and at the time, the leadership of the POA would not allow us to release that data to any third parties to try to make that graphical representation, and they had committed that they would do that. None of that ever happened. So it's not, not surprising that AT&T and suddenly went to bat to protect their turf because they don't want competition, right? So I know that you know you can go on the Sunlink's website, put in just about any address in Saline County that's here in the village, and it'll tell you that you have service, whether they have service there or not. Right. Uh, you know, I mean, my son just bought a house right over here on the retro, right over here. And he put it into Sunlink, and it said they had service there. They don't even have cable run down that street, right? So it's not surprising that they went to bat to try to protect that turf. We did not have any ammunition. I mean, we had the survey, but that's really hard to digest from a looking at it on a neighborhood by neighborhood that, basis. That's, that's where we the dropped the ball. Yeah. Bottom line is we dropped the ball. Right. Now I don't I don't know whether or not the survey results would have been significant enough. To change this result, uh, given, of course, the amount of lobbying dollars and other things that these big companies are gonna you know, throw at these legislators. Uh, but it certainly would have potentially helped us in terms of they were already gonna issue a grant, maybe trying to extend that. You know, and and really, we were looking at trying to how you could extend through the known service to these areas. And that's why I had the discussion with Diane, when she Diane Polowitz, where she lives up in up the north of Hans, where they have nothing. You know, that's in the village. Um, and Aristotle, the original grant application, had the ability to go through the village and pick up some of these areas. But since AT&T suddenly has that in the, the database there, that had to be, there was no money that would come to that. So, I mean, with the, the original application had the village in it. And had another area of the Saline County, both those were had to be removed to, to be able to get the grant. So like I'm saying, they could have the grant. Aristotle has the money to go right outside our gate on the East End. Uh, and how they wire that and will be sitting there right outside our gate, potentially come in and offer some competition to the 18th Chief and Sutherlands as well, because basically competition drives that. It's like we have someone laying cable right now. Mm -hmm. right. Donald DeSoto as a potential another competitor. So, right. and what would it take for the POA 
to give us the information to chart. And with it, we, we, uh, we have given the information to the POA to chart. Well, and, yeah, it has to be the reason why POA is saying no, we're not going to do it. They're not saying no, they want to do it. I think that it just didn't get to the top of their priorities. Because um, they said they were going to do it, it just never happened, right? So, and I know that, you know, I had another conversation with, with Stephanie Heffer just a couple of weeks ago, you know, on behalf of Lloyd Sherman, you know, to ask her about potentially do this. And I know that she was looking into it. I don't know if there's any progress still on that process. But one of the good things I think out of this is that there's some will be like right outside of them. Maybe there's a way that we could find a way to partner with them to provide them something that would allow them to come into the village, even if it's not part of the state grant method, right? Um, we could come up with enough customers, or we could give them a site where they can locate a tenant, or something like that. That might be a way that we could bring them into the village. Of course, they're going to do their own return on investment analysis because you know somebody's got to put up the money for the equipment and all the marketing, everything else, right? That would go into that process. But I think it does at least open an opportunity to have another carrier where we can have a, just a direct conversation with Aristotle from the village um, and see if that's something you know that's possible, how much would it cost, what would it look like. You know, I think that's that's an opportunity, uh, which at least they're the probably the next closest one to having service here, you know, than anyone else. So uh, of course we continue to work with Sunlink. I mean, Sunlink has generally been pretty responsive. And helping us get new coverage areas where the return on investment makes sense. Uh, you know, streets that were partially covered, you know, things like that. They've been pretty good about that. Um, whole new areas, I think it's a challenge. Um, and, and I think we, I think the developers here don't do a good enough job on that either. Because I know that this new development they're building right over here doesn't have cable service. And I don't know why that would be the case, why anybody would not. I mean, suddenly it's on the street right here at DeSoto, and they don't have suddenly service in that development. That doesn't make sense to me. But that's the developer's choice. We don't really have any say in that for the most part. Uh, and we certainly did talk to suddenly about that and the Madera's Gardens expansion. Uh, but again, it's up to the developer to make those decisions, you know, and to allow them to build in their development. So some of that's driven by money. Um, you know, I know I, I actually looked at a house in Dallas where they had an exclusive contract with AT&T, and their, their homeowner association got a kickback from AT&T for customers, right? So that stuff happens, and there's not a lot that we can do about it, but I think if we can find ways, especially with wireless carriers like Aristotle, we might have a chance to cover some of those other areas. But again, that's going to require some concerted effort on our part to understand exactly, because they're going to say, give me a concentrated area that I can go to. Right, and let me figure out how much it would cost to cover those people. So I know I live in the East End, and we approached AT and T, and our comment was, "No, we don't search." And actually, there was nothing there. Yeah. So we were forced to go to Hughes, and that's a joke. Yeah. But that whole area, and I'm talking around Granada. I mean, there's nothing. There's a blank area in Granada, and there's a blank area in Diamante, and there's a blank area in Vinifar. We know about all the blank areas. Right. We just couldn't have the, the, the data was not presented properly to to go back and get it because, like I said, on the original application that we looked at, it showed the Hot Springs Village and the areas to be covered in Hot Springs Village, which included the Diamante, the Granada, the Benifer areas, and how Aristotle would do that. However, when you do the overlay of what the state has, they would not provide grant money for that. So Aristotle said, okay, that's not grant money. You know, where's the grant take us? It takes us to the East, East Gate, basically. So now I have been able to develop that map, that information to present, I mean. Well, that's what Greg tried to do originally, is take it to the technology and computer club to do that. Right. Do you have a technical mapping for It's really not. I think what, what Greg is saying for it, and it's, since I'm not, I'm, not, I'm the elected official type of stuff here, <laughs> right. and I, I see you know, Charles is sitting in his office. Charles, if you want this, this might be something you want to put someone on. To, in your spare time, in your spare Charles. Time, Charles but <laughs> just let you know that this is one of the terms you inherit. <laughs> <laughs> 
with Aristotle. It, it, is it possible that um, it would be worth exploring the possibility of, as a developer comes in here, to make that part of their development responsibility requirement? For like Piega, for like yeah. Madera's Garden, I mean, places like that. I, I think okay, Mr. Developer, you can do this. Um, we will we will do X. You're going to do Y. I, I think that's an excellent idea. I don't know if we have the power to do that or not, but I certainly think that oh. we should definitely support it. And like I said, um, when they were doing the Madera's Gardens expansion, I reached out to suddenly they didn't know anything about it, right? About the Madera's Gardens expansion. So, I mean, I, I think that we need to try to impress that upon our developers. It's, to me, it seems like it would be in their best interest. Because, you know, one of the challenges that we will have with selling real estate here is if we don't keep up with broadband technology, people will not buy houses here. Um, and the other thing is that there is not a good point of reference for availability for broadband here in the village. Um, like I said, my son had bought this house over on Directo. You know, suddenly told him they had service, they didn't, right? AT&T told him that they had service, he's hopeful, right? But if he moves in there and they don't have it, he'll, he'll sell his house next week, right? Because well, he can't stay there. Yeah, the realtors will tell you that they've already lost sales yeah. and, on houses where... And they, the realtors yeah. don't know. Yeah, no, they don't. But to me, it's, we have reached a point where that's just another part of our utilities. Mm -hmm. So as we develop, it should be a part of the utility package that comes into that development. Right. Or they don't develop. Yeah. It, it's just a part of, of utility. It's just like electricity. It is, it, it is for sure. Now they add. Right. Um, and I think we have a, you know, a excellent opportunity to attract people that are trying to move away from large cities, like we're starting to see you know, in other parts of the country, uh, you know, where people are moving to all remote jobs, they're doing Zoom all the time, you know, they work remote all the time. Uh, they are going to move into areas that have high speed, good high speed internet connectivity uh, because they can't work anywhere else, right? And I know the school districts have this problem with the distance learning, you know, things like that as well. This is a huge challenge for the state of Arkansas given you saw the report which I gave you a couple of months ago that says we're last in the United States in broadband service, right? So, uh, I think for most of the village, we're not. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So, okay, well, let's, uh, we'll move along from that topic. Keith, you want to go ahead and just continue talking about Saline County? Sure, I'll just give you all the Saline County updates. Um, hopefully most of you know, early voting uh, location has been identified as the La Plaza Center for Saline County versus the bank, because the bank doesn't need social distancing. So La Paz Center um, at the far end there is where they're gonna have early voting. And then election day voting should still continue at Balboa Baptist. So they should be able to social distance there. So those are the concerns that I'm hearing from villages there, but just so that the GAC knows. Quorum Court, uh, a few items coming in Quorum Court. One of the big ones that is the Quorum Court will uh, put forth a resolution to allow the county judge and the mayor of Benton to come together to form a consolidated emergency ops center so that they will have one 911 center for Benton and Saline County. Um, so when the calls come in, they're not going to separate 911 centers. Unfortunately, Bryant, as the other big one, would not sign up for this. They have, so they're going to be out there with their own 911. But this is a big one for the, the county that most of the counties can be covered out of one 911 center. Uh, this goes in accordance with what the state wants to do to consolidate 911 centers. So this is a big step there. Uh, the challenge, if we don't have a Garland County um, rep here, is Garland County tried to do this with Hot Springs in Garland County a few years ago. Larry Griffin was here and it didn't go forward. So I don't know what, you know, but this is actually. It works out well because if you've ever been in the Sealy County 911 Center, the door, you open that door, and there's Benton's 911 Center there. So I feel it's open the door and they can work together. So it works, it works out for them. Uh -huh. right. uh, Mary talked about uh, highway. You know, 
Go ahead, Jim. Jim. Oh, I just like like to add for the group that that uh, what Keith is talking about with the call centers is a really really big deal and pretty remarkable in this time during past administrations the county and the city would not even talk about doing this so good good work on both benton and 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 the county's behalf uh mary talked briefly about the issue uh one thank you uh poa for the support uh the resolution for highway uh funding there issue one uh, Saline County Forum Court will actually do their issue resolution this month too. So, and the big push should be going on to get people out the vote. Uh, one of the challenges Saline County has also is maintaining qualified law enforcement. Uh, so, an initiative that going forward this month is actually merit pay for our sheriff in hopes of paying them a little bit more as they get certificates so that we don't keep losing our, our, our people who train them as a sheriff as a deputy and they move off to another department. But that's a, a, a big issue out there because if you get your different certificates, it's gonna be X amount of dollars a month that uh, the sheriffs will be added to each deputy pay out there. Lastly, Highway 5 safety remains a big issue. Uh, two accidents again this week on Highway 5. Uh, we are, I personally am trying to work with, with Rodney Wright to see how we can uh, do anything else here. The increased enforcement was there for a while after the, the, the one accident. But again, as soon as something else happens in the county or something else happens, uh, Arkansas Highway Police and the Sheriff's deputies get re rectored over to the next crisis. Uh, so this is gonna be an ongoing issue. Uh, we keep our fingers crossed that the next the remediation of the curves uh, does get the contract does get let in November. It's been split several times, but that would help out uh, with several with five different curves there. So where uh, that's where the fatality accident was. Uh, but there's still more. It's going to be in the future that uh, there's there's challenges. If you've seen on Facebook this morning showing the car over laying in the ditch uh, from I think that was either Wednesday morning that someone ran it off the road and trying to pass and took it off. So as I explained to someone yesterday, if you've been here in the 90s and remember how Highway 70 used to be coming off I-30 to get to Hot Springs, Highway 5 is kind of like that. It's, it's a challenge. So that's all I have from the county perspective. Any questions? All right, thanks. Uh, thanks a bunch, uh, Keith. Uh, how about the census committee? Any, any updates on the census? Uh, yeah, let me tell you uh, a little specifically and then a little generally. Uh, the census right now, both, both nationally and within the state, is very challenged. As all of you know, they're pulling their field workers out at the end of September. Uh, that was originally, originally planned for October. Uh, there's been a lot of change in personnel, uh, unannounced closings in the Chicago Regional Office, and other things you've read about in the paper. That is affecting returns all over the country. The national average on August 31st was 64.7% response. Uh, in Hot Springs Village, the total, well, let me go down. Uh, in the state of Arkansas, the response was 59.2%. In Hot Springs Village, the response was 58.9%. Compare that with 2010. At the end of, of the census, the response in Hot Springs Village was 72%. So, I, you know, I think there are a couple things going on. Uh, a lot of change and confusion uh, within the census program nationwide. And also you can't dismiss the effect of the cor coronavirus. And I think also probably for the first time, the census was focusing on 
electronic response. It's not the only way you can respond. You can respond by telephone. You can respond by mail. You can respond to somebody knocking on the door. But the primary effort has been focused on that. Uh, and, and the message, I believe, just hasn't gotten through well. Um, locally, we've made some pretty strong efforts to try to boost it up. And it has boosted up over the last two months but those have basically been tenths of percent boosted. So uh, uh, we're going to have to see how it all turns out. This has all been complicated as far as I'm concerned by the fact that we lost our regional coordinator, Alan Green, who retired August 21st. Uh, within the village, we have uh, had two key people who were tasked with the job of being staff coordinators uh, that, that have left employment of the POA. And at this point, have, we have nobody there designated for that role. Uh, that's a primary communication link and has hurt our local efforts somewhat. But that's what I have. The number you need to remember right now, total for Hot Springs Village, is a 58.9% response rate. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Jim, would promoting it more here in the village um, help? I know in the village digest, can you hear me? Jim, can you hear me? Uh, I, I can hear you. Uh, more is always better, but a lot of that through the Village Digest, through the, uh, uh, through the um, social media site, all that has been done. We've done a lot as well with organizations such as churches. Um, you know, every, everything helps, but I, I, I don't I don't believe there's been a uh, a stone that's been left unturned. I think it's just caught one in the broad, broad, and, and you all read this in the paper every day, uh, the management and implementation of the census process nationally uh, and the pandemic, I think have just hurt the response rates enorm uh, enormously. So I know that in the Village Digest, for example, there's a one-liner that says, do the census, take the survey. Could we um, see about adding a little bit more in there? And I don't know about the rest of you, but what motivates me to do something is if I know why I want to do it and what happens if I don't do it. So just a one-liner that says take the survey is not highly motivating. So if we Yeah, I think there's been more of that than that from time to time. I do think that's the ongoing piece. But but yeah, if we can sit down with the people who do the digest, and as I said, Pam, a part of the effort, the part of the problem right now is we don't have active staff liaison. And that's been vital to the effort. Uh, we basically haven't had it since Renee left. Uh, Jamie was tasked with it, and, and she had other polls too, and, and we don't have it. I can't get it into the, into the digest. You can, Jim, whatever you want in the digest, send to me, and I'll make sure it gets in there. Well, and all, I can't even get to the material. You know, it, it, it's all, all the material, all the promotional material is, is, was at Renee's fingertips and I don't have access to it right now. I don't have anything to give you. I will, I'll see what I can find. We'll make it happen. All right, that'd be helpful and I'd appreciate it. Hey Jim, Jim, I wanted to ask yeah, you, but, can the, School superintendents do anything to also uh, encourage uh, parents to do that? Yes, they can and they have. Okay. 
Jim, uh, here's the challenge I see, and I'm using an example up in my neighborhood because I was walking the dog and ran into the census table. And he was knocking on the door to one house. And I know the, the kind of the renters who live there. And I would bet the renters are not on any village media whatsoever. Yeah. How do we deal with those folks? I mean, he tried several times to get those folks to respond. Um, I talked to him and gave him, here's who lives there. You know, gave him names even, you know. Did the thing, you know, here's how many people I think live there. But how do we reach out to those type of folks? And you know we got a bunch of those folks uh, probably on the west side even more because we have more rental properties over there that they're just, they may or may not be on the Village Digest. They may or may not be on HSB, community, yeah. whatever website uh, on Facebook. That's where I think some of our challenge is, and I know the poor guy, it, it was kind of funny, because I don't know if you know Jane Brown, and it's her husband, John, who's doing the census. John's driving around and trying to do the census, and he's just going, we're doing our best. You know, these folks don't answer the door. Uh, and you know, very honestly, I knew someone was in that house, and they won't answer the door, because there's a different personality of some certain people. Pam, is there, is there a possibility that there could be an insert put in the water bill? I mean, we is there a, a possibility every other month, right? Seems like that would be an opportunity with no additional cost that that could be, to communicate I'm, with some of these folks that are not on electronic media, uh, even to the extent that broadband or other things. If there was a process or a way that we could put something in a water bill, or even print something on the water bill, I don't know. Whatever. Or, okay. or put, I mean, Jim, I don't know, did we ever put signs out through the census? You know, physical, like the garage sale signs? I don't think we ever did, did we, Jim? Uh, no. Yeah, simple things like when we closed DeSoto, we put the big sign out there. Close, close, close. You know, do we need to reach that point? No. Well, I didn't see the soda, but was it a digital sign or was it just a... There was a roadside digital sign. sign. Yeah, these are one that they put on the street, the highway sign. Why aren't, yeah, why can't we get one of those at each gate? You know, we've explored I've, I've suggested that before and got nowhere. Yeah. 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 One thing you said was right, the reason. In Concordia, in Cloud County, they didn't promote, they promoted it one way. Census means this more money to our county. That hit home. Because all of a sudden they actually put, this population gets this amount. This population can get this amount. That's the only thing they pushed. And that hit home because it was something that affects people's pockets. Okay, good, good thinking. Uh, and Jim, do you have access, or is that the information that Renee had? And Ella is going to look for that. Is is it the same information that is is what 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 information are you referring to, Pam? More detailed information on the importance of taking the census. Why we want to do that? About money. Uh, I have I have some information on that. There's even more in uh, what was Renee's files. There, there is a website. There's a website. It's arcounts.org slash resources. And it's got a lot of flyers and it's got videos and it's got a lot of information about why you should complete the census and who it affects and how it affects them. Um, that might be a really yeah. good resource. It's got some already pre-prepared things. Oh, awesome. That, that's, that's true. And another site, which I think is probably the broader site from what Melissa's talking about, is uh, 2020census.gov, where you can go and actually complete the sentence, the census. I can put a link to that in the Village Digest today. Do it. That would be great. And I, I think, too, that we ought, 
ought to share the fact that the village is way behind in uh, what we have previously done in the census. Uh, uh, I think that piece of information, Jim, those, those statistics, the percentage there, needs to be shared uh, broadly. We need to catch up. Alan, did you have time to do a short piece for the digest, or would you like me to do it and get it to you? Yes. I, I'm actually doing the digest today for Joseph. I'm going to finish okay. it for him. And the other thing, Jim, I don't know, if, have we ever put anything on our scrolling message boards? Because we could certainly do that. They're in every golf shop. Hey, well, people aren't using those as much because they're not going into the golf shops as much. They're calling in to check in. Okay. I mean, I don't tend not to go to the golf shop now, Bill. I just yeah. call and check me in. That, I, you know, that, that's, that's a piece. The scrolling boards are good, and yeah, we can put something on there, but nobody goes into them. But I think, Pam, you kind of hit it, and I think we have one of those signs. And Ella, I'll bet we have more than one. Well, the, 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 the big flashing digital signs, yeah. the ones that I think that came in were rented for yes. DeSoto Boulevard. <laughs> okay. But so. I thought we actually had one. Okay. So talk to Jason. He may yeah. have one because there's another. I think so. I'll, I'll talk to Jason. Yeah. Okay. All right. We need to. I think we need to move on a little bit from this topic. Uh, uh, do we have any comments or notes from any of the Metro plans? Anything going on with Metro plan? Uh, as far as Metro plan up in Little Rock, uh, they're putting out for their the call for projects and the big project that Celine County is going to put money in for is for Southwest Trail. So that's continuing to you know, try to garner some more funds to keep working on the Southwest Trail. Uh, actually, How does Southwest Trail affect the village? Southwest Trail eventually could affect the village and then it will run basically down Highway 70. Um, so it's going to go from Little Rock all the way down Highway 70 to Hot Springs. So it'll be another recreational thing. The challenge will be once they get the Southwest Trail in, how do we as the village connect? and start promoting to run another trail over there so our people can go connect it to the Southwest Trail. That's five years down the road, Cheryl. All right. Thank you. That, that's that. But that's hard if you, you think ahead. The yes. reason I ask that is because I'm hearing a lot of people, of course, in panic mode. Oh my God, they're going to bring a trail <laughs> in and they're going to have access to our village with no gates. The, the so trail is actually nowhere close to the river. Southwest Trail is something in the future if you want to you know, it's another one of those marketing tools that we can get access. But again, to run a trail from our east gate to the southwest trail is five, no, it's yeah. 10 miles. Ten miles. Right. So, so that right. would be something in the future. The southwest trail needs to get built. That's the big thing. How do we look out into the future to start politicking? And I'll be very, that's what we're going to have to do politic to get funds from to do, you know, those type of things. But that's something. But it would be something that came in through one of the man gates. Yeah. It would not be something that had a car gate out here in the middle of nowhere. No. You can see it coming right at the east oh. gate type of stuff. Yeah, you, think, you can see it going from the east gate, probably going through Owensville or something about that way an hour. Owensville cut off. Yeah. That's, you know, that's, that's the road. If you cut through Owensville, went down to Owensville, cut off. But again, it's pretty far down the road. Yeah, it's down the road. And still hopeful that it actually gets built. <laughs> well, I mean, yeah, but that, All that, that makes information will help relieve some of the yeah. conversation that's out there. Yeah, it's right. not anytime soon that you're yeah. going to have the Next week, right. we're going to have people coming through. No. <laughs> <laughs> but like, any, any, you know it's out there. That conversation is out there. Right. Anybody know anything about tri links? Anything going on with tri links? All information. Yeah. I know. Fake news. Um, Fake news. Jerry, anything on the health services you'd like to add? Um, as far as I can determine, I have tried several times to get a hold of it, Eric. I saw at Good Samaritan. It does not appear that they will hold the health fair this year because of COVID. Uh, we had discussed maybe holding it at a different facility, letting them continue to run it to hold it outside of the but that does not appear to have any interest in that. So it's off for this year. Um, as we talked earlier, there is a new doctor coming in to replace Dr. Q, and I 
and I am trying to get this information because we're getting ready to update the medical directory. Right. Every six months, every six That's months, I think we update. Speaking of things that we normally did in the past, the uh, uh, candidate forums, uh, we've reached out to both of the parties. Doesn't appear that any of them are doing any live candidate forums anywhere. Um, so I don't anticipate we'll be doing candidate forums uh, this year because again, because of the COVID pandemic. So uh, I know that Bob reached out and reached out to both parties as well through that. No, that wasn't you. It was uh, and, uh, Kurt Malone. Oh, Kurt, yeah, Kurt did. Yeah. Um, and I know there's basically been no response, and I talked to them as well, just informally, as I've seen them, and uh, there's no, they have no plans for any kid anymore. Not even going to try a virtual forum, huh? I don't think so. Yeah. So that people could send in questions and then they yeah. The candidates themselves don't have any interest in it, I think. I think when you look at the higher level candidates, you know, the presidential and the, the Congress, they're not really interested. And we don't have a lot of state. Right. They, I mean, you got JP, this places, but you don't have any, the county judge is not up for elections. The assessor, all those county positions are not for elections. Right. Are not, okay. And the governor is not up. So all the local, there's very little local. It's right. high level and they're busy right. doing whatever they do. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Creating it. <laughs> All right. Um, we'll move on to. Uh, this is my quick. Can anybody hear me? Who's that? Mike? Yeah, I, something happened to the speaker, and I, I can barely hear everyone. All right. We're having a hard time understanding you as well. Hello. 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 Did you have a, did you have something you want to report? Mike? No, I, I, I can't, I just can't hear. Something happened to the speaker all of a sudden. Yeah, I think we, we can hear you. I think the others can hear us. I don't know, maybe something on your phone side. Okay. Okay. I'll, I'll try to keep listening. Okay. Did you have anything you wanted to report? Well, we got you. Uh, not, not right now. I just, I guess, I should mention that I've had, in terms of the candidate forums, uh, I don't know if Kurt's there today, but uh, he's talked with the, the Democrats, and I guess, as I understand it, they're because of COVID, they don't think they can do a live candidate forum. Forum, they may do something electronically, and uh, I've talked to one Republican official who expressed the same sentiment essentially. And so Kurt and I need to get together on that and, and see what we can work out, if anything. So that's, that's all I have. And if you can, and unless Kurt has additional information. Yeah, Kurt, Kurt's not here today, but I think that's what he had reported to me was that it didn't okay. appear that your party was going to do any sort of you know, candidate forums, and they might do something electronically, but they don't have any plans currently. Right, that's that's my understanding as well. Okay. okay. Sorry to interrupt, I just couldn't hear. No problem. Uh, Melissa, you want to tell us a little bit about what's going on at Jessica? How's it going? Sure. It, it's going well, all things considered, much better than we thought, than we were afraid we would have. We had a, a, have had a good start first two weeks of school. Um, we have 12% of our students who opted for our virtual learning option where they are learning from home. They're joining their classes live from home and, and that's going well. We've had a few of them who tried that for a day or two and decided, oh, I miss being on campus and they've transitioned back. So. That's going well. Um, I wanted to say a, a thank you too to anybody who is part of the, we had two different groups who created uh, cloth face masks for us and donated numerous cloth face masks for our students. And that was a great help. Those, we had purchased two for every single student and um, these additional ones have come in handy as well. So we were very appreciative of that. We are taking 
multiple safety measures to keep our staff and students safe. We are sanitizing uh, even more so than we did prior to the start of COVID. Um, our buses are sanitized twice a day at the end of each route. They, we are re requiring students 10 years and older to wear face masks uh, if they can't be more than six feet apart and teachers and staff are wearing them as well. We are recommending them for our younger students. And then we have also purchased and received those um, midweek this week, some desk shields that will, they're clear shields that will sit on the students' desks just to provide them a little more protection. So we're doing everything we can in our power to keep our students and staff safe. So far, we've not had, knock on wood, so far we've not had any positive cases since school started among our student body or our staff. Um, we are praying that that continues. We'd like to keep everybody in school as much as possible. Uh, we received, we were talking about broadband and the hotspots that the state provided. Jesseville was awarded 45 of those free units. We have received, we, we chose to take part of them as Verizon units and part of them as AT&T units because in some parts of our district, you get better service from Verizon than you do AT&T and, and vice versa. So we have received our AT&T units. We are expecting our Verizon units uh, mid-month and hopefully uh, we can get those distributed. We have started distributing our AT&T units to our students who need them. We also purchased an additional 10 hotspots back in the spring when all of this started. We purchased those with district funds. So we feel like for our students who maybe don't have Wi-Fi at home, don't have broadband access, but do have cell service, we've got sufficient um, hotspots to cover those students. Does not help our students at all who live in the most rural areas and don't have access to anything. So. Uh, we will be working with those students should they have to be quarantined at some point. One of the issues that we are having, and I don't know if Dr. Murphy, if they're having the same issue at Fountain Lake, but there have been a couple of days already since the start of school, a few days, that we've needed a substitute teacher and the organization that we partner with to provide our substitutes has been able, unable to do so. I've reached out to them and I'm not sure if, and we just needed one sub on most of those days and weren't able to fill that position. And I don't know, um, it's unclear at this point whether that's related to COVID and people just aren't willing to come in and substitute in the districts or if it's an issue that there are so many who have need, so many districts in Garland County who have need at the same time that the pool just isn't big enough. But that's one of the issues that we've run into so far. And, Thankfully, it's, it's just been one teacher and we've been able to cover that. And I'm not sure what we'll have to do if we, have, if we send several home or we have several out. So that's what I have to report. We have our first home football game tonight. So we'll see. We'll, everybody that attends has to wear their mask and we have to socially distance. But we'll see how that goes tonight. Thank you, Melissa. Uh, Dr. Murphy, I see it looks like you transitioned to your phone. Uh, you yeah, I had to, to, uh, yeah, I had to, I've got to get to a meeting here. I'll give you just a quick update. Uh, our story's been a little bit different. Uh, I'm gonna stop there, can you still hear me? Yes. Okay, um, you know, I'm looking here, numerically we opened the school employees in quarantine day one so I had to have seven subs for day one uh, currently I have six employees quarantine 15 elementary students, 26 middle school students and three high school students who are quarantined for up to as much as 14 days based on them being uh in proximity with a test positive for 15 minutes in a 24-hour period of time uh, we have three test positives in the school district. Uh, so with three current test positives, that results in that degree of disruption to the setting. Um, I would tell you that uh, along the same lines, we received the hotspots. We have roughly 30% of our students going virtual. Uh, and and uh, with that, uh, 
I don't know if it's the size of the system, options for parents, but uh, approximately 30% of our population is not on campus. Probably the best start to the year we've ever had based on the degree of structure that we put into the system as far as kids getting where they need to be when they get off a school bus or they get out of a car, they go directly to their classroom. And uh, we're, we've found that uh, all of that structure has truly uh, started our day consistently and well. Uh, you know, I think based on the guidelines, uh, what we're contending with, we're doing the very best that we can. Uh, we did have to cancel week one's football game against Hot Springs because we had uh, our entire lineman had to quarantine based on a test positive in the coaching staff. So it, it really uh, will be intermittent with activities all fall because you're relying on two different schools to be healthy at the same time to even have a game, whether that's uh, volleyball, football, basketball, et cetera. Uh, definitely trying times. Uh, but overall, I think uh, the environment is stabilized, safe, and, and well-structured. And uh, we've had a lot of compliments on just the degree of school. But, uh, you know, depending on – we have seating charts at lunch. We have seating chart for everything so we can identify. Um, we have someone who does have uh, any of the test positives we've had have been just very minor illnesses, either with employees or with students. And in some instances, as we know, this virus uh, likes to live as much asymptomatic as it does symptomatic. And so in that context, uh, uh, some people don't even exhibit a symptom associated with it and test positive. But we've learned uh, probably a, a lot more about a virus since the opening of school and the school districts are responsible for all of the contact tracing that occurs and I serve as that point of contact for our school district and uh, when we have a test positive it literally takes a full day to prepare the report to send to the health department uh, because we have to in some instances follow that child's footsteps for a matter of three or four days in a school setting so uh, a little bit unrealistic, but we're doing the very best we can based on the circumstances that were handed at this point. Probably more than you wanted to hear. <laughs> no, it's actually good, uh, good information, and thanks so much for providing that. I know that a lot of people in the village have been, you know, quite wanting, wanting to know kind of how the schools were going. I mean, we do have a lot of schools over here, uh, you know, in the village, so. I know there are a lot of people interested in kind of how it's going in the different districts. Uh, sounds like you're doing the best with what you've been dealt so far, and that uh, it's actually going okay. <laughs> I think that's probably that is certainly the best I think we can hope for at this point. So uh, thanks so much for all that, that you guys do. I know that's a tough job, and uh, we certainly appreciate it, and our kids definitely appreciate it as well. So uh, any other reports from anyone else on the conference? All right, seeing uh, no other reports, anyone else uh, here in the room, any other comments? There's one other area that we need to look at in terms of, uh, uh, you know, the committee is that we are being required to revise our charter. Uh, I did send you a copy of the revised charter, uh, along with uh, information about the meeting today. Uh, there were actually two of them that were sent. One was the one that I originally sent. Then there was a clarification document sent by the board, uh, which added some additional verbiage, which then I put into my updated charter uh, and resent that as well. I don't think that necessarily there was anything controversial related to the, the charter amendments uh, or the things that I put into the charter. Um, it is effectively the same with the changes primarily around the ability of the board representative and the POA representative now being uh, voting members and having duties and responsibilities similar to all other committee members. Um, and also kind of clarifying the ad hoc members from the counties, school districts, um, and our ability to have them on our committee as well. Uh, there were some other things in the original charter which sort of 
were in conflict of that and didn't necessarily lay that out. Um, certainly, I don't think that some of our county officials or even like the school superintendents, we want them to be participate. You know, in our committee, we don't necessarily need them to be property owners, which was in our original charter that everyone that's had a meeting ad hoc or otherwise had to be a property owner. So there were some additions and changes that I made to that. Um, I appreciate any comments. Feel free to send them by email. Uh, you know, we're going to have a, I'm going to a board discussion session this coming Wednesday about the clarification items that they sent out as well, um, along with the other committee, uh, chairman, chairwoman, uh, to have a discussion if there's any other changes. I don't want to necessarily officially adopt this charter yet, in case there are further clarifications that do come from the board uh, related to that, but I wanted to at least give you an idea of the changes that we are looking for. So I'm open to any other discussions or anything that people think I should bring up at that discussion session that's coming up this week. Greg, I have I have uh, two questions or one question, two part. Are board members currently voting members? Yes. Are they voting members of every committee? Yes. And that happened a year ago, right? Yes. That wasn't clarified though a year ago whether they would vote or not. So that's what, true. That's yeah. What this is about. Yeah. It was clarified at the beginning of this year that they would be voting official members. I, I say that again, Greg. It was clarified earlier this year for the board that those members would be voting committee members. And what was the rationale for that? I, that I do not know. I wasn't part of that board discussion. Jim, I think yes. the, rat, the uh, uh, I think the rationale really, <clears throat> excuse me, stemmed from uh, the marketing subcommittee last year that um, was trying to push some recommendations forward and so on and and. Um, uh, the recommendations weren't looked upon favorably, and so the board wanted a means to better control some of the committee and the output, and that's why they gave them the vote. Doesn't make sense to me, but we'll not. I, you know, I remember the discussion of that a year ago, and it was pretty controversial, and as far as I was concerned, I thought it was pretty much opposed by our committee. It was. It was. It was. Pam, Pam did oppose that at the time when she was here. Uh, that's what I recall. And I, I guess if I personally, if I thought it was a bad idea, idea a year ago, I still think it's a bad idea. That's not something that we have control over. We're, we're, we, we serve at the pleasure of the board, so we have to live by their rules, unfortunately. So um, this is the current rule. And so as but I said, our board rep can take that back. Absolutely. The board that the committees are not in favor. I personally look at it as a conflict of interest. I, Pam, as I, I, you know, I don't want to put you on the spot, but but as I recall, a year ago, you were very strongly opposed to it. I was, and I still am. In fact, I'm not. A, if you ask, and open the door. I'm opposed to having the board person, board rep, and the staff rep as members of the committee. I still believe that their role should be liaison. And the response I got when I when I put that in front of the board was that, well, yes, they'll still serve as liaisons, but they're now, now called members. Well, then why call them members? So I, well, think, um, I, I think they've muddied the water. Yes. And I, and I think there is some conflict between that and the clarification they said, because it says in the clarification that, that committee members cannot direct staff, cannot do anything. Well, if the general manager of the POA is a member and the staff person is a member, then that's in total conflict with that clarification. That's, a, that's exactly right. And, and as, 20, as, as the new version is written, 
it does not even say that the general manager is a voting member. I mean, that's foggy. It does say that in the new version, I think. It does say that. It says actually says the staff liaison appointed by the general manager, who could be the general manager or anyone else he might appoint, is a, is a member of the committee. I think it does say that. Doesn't necessarily mean the staff liaison has to be the general manager. It it does, but it it, it in section three C it specifically says the representative of the board of directors shall have a permanent seat on the committee and shall be considered as a voting member. Section D says the general manager or his designee shall be appointed as a committee member with all the responsibilities required. It doesn't specifically say the general manager or his designee will be a voting member. I think that the directive of the board is that they would be a voting member, so we can modify that and add that. Yeah. I am, um, you know, I, I, I guess a part of what I'm saying Pam and Greg is that the charter has been reviewed any numbers of times with committee input and I don't feel that's happening right now. Yeah, we were basically told that these were the changes that we need to make to this charter. Well, and that, 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 that was, that was a problem last year. Uh, and there's a problem now, and, and, and there is a board now that says it's committed to fix the, fixing the problems of a year ago. And to my mind, in this instance, it's perpetuating them. Now, from an outsider looking in, to me, they're defeating their purpose. The purpose of these committees are to come up with advice or consult with the board who has the authority, the yes or no. But when you put board members on this thing, it just, you don't get a full view of what the committee really believes because they're gonna stand there and start fighting right away with you. So why have us? I mean, if that's a handle thing, they should have one. Well, I, unfortunately, it's gotten to be um, kind of a complex issue, but, but you're right, Jim Donnan is correct. And hopefully at the discussion session on Wednesday, some of this will come out. Some of it happened because they're trying to make all the committees look the same, but all the committees aren't the same. They have, they're like three or four different functions. The GAC is totally different from the ACC, which is totally different from recreation, oh, from the recreation. recreation type of thing. So, so they can't, they can't get that uniformity that they would like to have. The other additional part is that on a couple of the committees, they have taken it upon themselves to actually instruct the employees to actually be in the employee space. And so they're trying to prevent that with some wording, but again, because all the committees aren't the same, the same wording does not work. Right. But that I understand as far as employees. But what does that have to do with the board of voting right. on the committee? It, does, it, it doesn't. And, and again, that was an attempt a year ago. He knows that was an attempt to control. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, so anyway, let me know. I'll definitely take these comments to the discussion session with the board, which is this coming Wednesday afternoon. Um, I will be there to bring up these items, which I see as somewhat problematic. But again, you know, we kind of have to do what the board tells us to do. So, um, but we'll bring those comments. And Jim, your comments are very well founded um, and are not unlike some of the ones that I had expressed and I know Pam had expressed last year when this first started. So. We'll see where that goes. I would expect to look for another revision of our charter uh, sometime after next week when uh, they talk about this. Uh, really just uh, one other item, definitely looking for additional speaker ideas. 
Uh, anyone knows people they think would be good speakers, uh, we definitely welcome that. David uh, is doing a really good job of coordinating the speakers. I'm able, uh, unfortunately, he's not able to attend today. Uh, but if you know people, you serve on, you know, with, with on boards or with clubs or whatever, uh, you definitely welcome to have those speakers. I know that, you know, I've been, you know, as a member of Rotary, we've had some great speakers. We had uh, Fish and Wildlife here, you know, this week, you know, to talk about things that are going on in their world. You know, because all those kind of speakers, I think, would be good. There were a lot of questions to the Fish and Wildlife people about their urban deer hunt, for example, which I think would be good information you know, for the village in general to know more about that. So definitely welcome, you know, any future speaker ideas, feel free to send them to me or David um, or Bob so that we can make sure we get those followed up on. So um, that's all the things that I have on the agenda. Anyone else have any other items they would like to bring up today? Yeah, we do have some open responsibility areas. As you'll see from the agenda, we do have some Areas that we now need to try to figure out how to fill. Uh, we're going to work with Sam and put him in one of these areas to see to do as well. Uh, and I think now we have another opening on the committee, uh, unfortunately, with the passing of David. So uh, we'll look to identify another candidate. We do have three other applications that people have applied. Uh, so we'll probably be looking at and interviewing those folks uh, as well uh, for potential membership on our committee. So. Uh, anyone that wants to jump up and raise their hand, you know, on any of these other open areas of responsibility, we certainly will accept any help that we can get. Uh, our next uh, Government Affairs Committee meeting will be on October the 2nd at 9 a.m. I expect we'll do again in-person and Zoom meeting uh, for that for that next meeting coming up uh, in October. Uh, so with that, I'll take a motion for adjournment. Anybody? Make that motion and then we'll call it a day. All right. All in favor? Aye. All right. All right. We are adjourned. Thank you very much, everybody.